there. My name is Derek Stiles. I'm an assistant professor at Rush University in Chicago. Um, this is the slideshow that I presented in 2011 on working memory. Today I'll be talking a bit about a certain cognitive process called working memory. I'll be starting with some history on the development of working memory, a description of its current embodiment, particularly the model of working memory developed by Alan Baddeley, and I will relate working memory to our field of communication disorders, and then with some information on identification and treatment of people with working memory problems. I have a personal bias toward child-oriented research, but I have attempted to include some adult data as well. In the beginning, there was the brain, a mysterious organ of thought and perception. Until the 1950s, the scientific understanding of memory was a bit fuzzy. In the late 1950s, researchers started paying attention to memory phenomenon. For example, that the ability to remember a list of items could be impeded if someone was prevented from rehearsing the information. This led to a proposal that there are two types of memory that use different operational rules. Short-term memory, which spans just a matter of minutes, and long-term memory, which kicks in after those few minutes. This was supported by case studies of different amnesic patients, those with classical long-term memory loss who might remember a telephone number you told them but not remember what they ate that morning, and those who could not perform short-term memory tasks, such as remembering the phone number, but could recall what they had eaten that morning. By the late 60s, more and more evidence had accumulated in support of separate short-term and long-term memory systems. Atkinson and Schifrin in 1968 developed a multi-store model where an information entered into a temporary sensory memory system first. If you paid attention to that information, it would transfer to a limited capacity short-term store where some processing task could take place. That processing could take place I'm sorry, that processing could take place lent itself to the term working memory. Information that was rehearsed, retained in this short-term store for long enough, was then transferred into the long-term store. So forgetting can happen anywhere along the way. In the 1970s, Badley and Hitch began a three-year collaboration researching the relationship between short-term and long-term memory. They determined that a unitary short-term store was too simple and developed a three-component model of working memory incorporating the phonological loop, visual spatial sketchpad, and central executive. Badley continued to adapt his model based on ever-increasing sources of data. The biggest change occurred in 2000 when the episodic buffer was added to the working memory model. Here you see his current model. There's a central executive. This is kind of the boss who's in charge. There's a phonological loop that is involved with um, memory for language, um, spoken word type information, a visual spatial sketch pad that's involved in um, retaining visual information, and an episodic buffer that kind of helps synchronize the information that's coming in from the phonological loop or the visual spatial sketch pad. And all of these are getting information from long-term memory as well. This is not the only model of working memory, but it has has held up for 40 years and is the most referenced model in the literature. The visual spatial sketch pad is specialized for storing and processing visual inputs. It's how you cross the room without bumping into furniture when the lights go out or when you play a memory game. So look at these objects. Now what's missing? If you were able to recall what was missing, that's evidence of your ability to retain information in the visual spatial sketch pad. So the visual spatial sketch pad is sensitive to location, trajectory, color, size, shape, and orientation. The phonological loop is specialized for auditory and primarily linguistic information. In this model, it consists of a store and a rehearsal mechanism. This sub-vocal mechanism may not kick in until around six or seven years of age. So we're going to play a game with your phonological memory to demonstrate just how fragile it is. So um, we're going to do a little test of your phonological loop. 
So if you have a piece of paper, you can do this. You're going to see a series of words, and I want you to try to remember all of them. And then when you see the pencil, write them down in the same order as best you can. So don't write the words down until after you see the pencil. So the first list you're going to do is going to be considered the baseline list. Alright, write those down in the order that you saw them. Alright, we're going to go to the next list. You can label this list as AS. And for this list, I want you to be saying the, 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 the entire time that you see the words and also the entire time that you're writing down the words. The, 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 you should all be saying the, 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 the right now. All right, and keep saying the, 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 the as you write down your words. Okay, this list you don't need to be saying the, the, the. Just want you to do like we did with the first list. All right, write those down. All right. And this is the last list, I believe. So write those down in the order that you saw them. All right, so here are the answers to the, to the um, lists. So you can kind of score yourself and see how well you did. So you may have experienced some of the interference that can occur um, in the phonological loop. Um, so one way that you can interfere with the memory system in the phonological loop is through what's called articulatory suppression. So that's what you experienced when um, you were saying the, 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 the. Your articulation of words that were unrelated to the words in the list made it more difficult to remember the words on the list. Also, longer words can affect how well um, you're able to recall. So the longer the words are in the list, the, hard, the fewer you can remember. And then the irrelevant speech effect is if you're trying to recall those words and you're hearing somebody else talking and saying irrelevant things. So that also makes it hard to um, encode um, or keep those words in the phonological loop. Um, also, phonological similarity, so where the items are similar to each other, um, what happens is those items can um, interact with each other within the, the storage of the phonological loop. And so it becomes easier to um, kind of mess up the list. So that one word list where a lot of the words were similar, like mat, man, and can, um, some people have more difficult times with those lists because the words are relatively similar. But there is an auditory advantage. Um, so you were seeing the words. If you had actually been listening to the words being spoken to you as opposed to reading them off the screen, that would have improved your performance. So the phonological loop actually seems to be 
kind of tuned in to auditory information and auditory input. So the episodic buffer, that's that recently added component, and it helps describe the relationship between short-term and long-term memory, and why sometimes maybe if you forget something in short-term memory, the long-term memory systems can kind of help um, support um, re-remembering re what, what was in that short-term memory system. Um, and then there's also um, evidence for chunking across modalities. So visual and phonological information that are arriving to you together might be processed a little bit differently than visual information alone or phonological information alone. And there's MRI research supporting that different mental processes are engaged during this kind of chunking process. So in 2000, um, Prabhakaran um, looked at how, how this kind of chunking across modalities might work. And he found that um, if you saw letters alone, um, so like DKR here, that only activated the left hemisphere. And so that was basically evidence kind of that the phonological loop seemed to be um, associated with the left hemisphere. Um, a spatial array, such as this here, activated the right hemisphere. And this is kind of a visual spatial sketch pad activity, recalling where these boxes were located on the screen. Now if you have the, the letters also in different spaces, so you're involving the phonology and the visual spatial cortex, um, this bound information activated the right frontal cortex. So this suggested that there was another brain region being used for processing this bimodal information. So it's still relatively undefined structure compared to others. So sometimes you'll see episodic memory referenced in an article, and that's usually regarding memory for phonological and visual information. So some things to consider about the central executive, which is really the, the big boss of this whole system, is that it's very flexible, but it's also considered to be a finite resource. So some of the things that the central executive system is involved with um, are related to attention. So allocating attention, you know, choosing what we're going to send our attention to, um, updating the information that is coming in, um, dividing attention, so if you have to um, focus on multiple things simultaneously, and then sustaining attention and trying to keep keep our attention when maybe something's not really <laughs> exciting us very much. And also, the central executive in, is involved in inhibition, which is really kind of tuning out the things that we um, may not want to be distracting us. But uh, central executive system is a finite resource, meaning that if there's too much stuff going on, it can break down. Executive function kicks in for events that are non-habitual. So, you know, a lot of the things that we do in life are just kind of the same thing day after day, and they're very routine, and we don't need to um, pay much attention. But if we ever come out of our routine, the executive um, function is what kind of kicks in and make sure that we're doing the right thing. So you can think of times when maybe the um, that system has failed, like if you um, normally drive to you know the grocery store on Saturday and this Saturday for a change you're going to visit a friend and you end up starting to drive to the grocery store anyways. Um, that's an evidence of failure of that executive function kicking in. Um, an individual with executive deficits may demonstrate problems across different areas, including attention, working memory, um, inhibition, and shifting attention. So hopefully right now you are all paying attention to me, and if you are, that's good, because that means that your executive system is working. My computer's running very slow. Here we go. So selective attention is important um, as a way to hold information and working memory. 
And so here's an example of a good student who is reading maybe something about genetics. But maybe there's other, possibly more interesting books available to look at. Um, but they're not necessarily a huge distraction. But suddenly the student's cell phone vibrates. Is it an important message? Should he look at it now or keep studying? And what is up with these nutrition students? Don't they have anything better to do? And oh my gosh, was that a bat? So what can happen is that the number of distractors in the environment can become too much, which leads to basically exasperation and, and making it difficult to think. Um, and that's kind of the breaking point of, of the central executive. Executive function peaks in adulthood, and then with aging, things begin to change again. Um, things like switching and flexibility decline, although um, strict attention seems to stay relatively constant throughout old age. And to complete executive tasks, older adults seem to engage more neural systems than young adults, which may explain some of the slower processing that's seen in the elderly. And that's after accounting for just the general slowing um, in reaction times that you see in aging populations. So to summarize Badley's model, we've got the central executive system, which is involved in attention, inhibition, switching, and resource allocation. The episodic buffer, which synthesizes information across modalities. The visual spatial sketch pad, which is involved with location, trajectory, and visual features. And phonological loop, which is involved in um, memory for phonological inputs and includes a subvocal rehearsal mechanism. It's also finite and there's kind of a balance between how much processing is being done and how much information can be stored. So the fewer processing demands there are, the more could be stored in the system. Um, but as the processing demands increase, such as in the face of distractors, then the amount of storage seems to uh, decrease. So now I'm going to be talking about working memory as it relates to speech and hearing. And this is just a sampling, and researchers are continuing to discover more and more about the relationship between working memory and communication disorders, but there's still a lot um, that's interesting. So there's some evidence to support that working memory is used for vocabulary development. If a child cannot remember the order of the phonemes in a word that they're hearing, or retain the phonological information as he maps it to the semantic content, um, such as matching the word kitten to the object kitten, then that representation will be unstable. The relationship between working memory and vocabulary is strongest before kindergarten. So beyond first grade, the relationship weakens, which may reflect other strategies for word learning being used in elementary school kids. The types of words children are learning become more abstract, and so understanding the meaning may be more of an issue than recalling the phonological form necessarily. Working memory isn't restricted to vocabulary development. There's evidence that children with better working memories will do better at producing and understanding syntactically complex sentences, such as, the hippo that the lion kissed on the nose was running into the jungle. So I'll read that sentence again and then I'll ask you some questions. The hippo that the lion kissed on the nose was running into the jungle. So whose nose was being kissed? And who ran into the jungle? And what about reading development? Children with poor working memory tend to have more difficulty with acquiring letter knowledge, um, particularly sounds that don't have their sound as part of the letter name. So B, B is easy to remember, but G, G uh, is harder to remember that association. Also, they have more difficulty with deciphering words through sounding them out. Um, like Mr. S has super socks. In textual comprehension, children are building a mental model of the information. They establish links between the sentences in the text and between the text and their general knowledge. So working memory's effect appears to be strong between 8 and 11 years old. 
So in a text such as this, last night Jill walked home through the woods. There was no moonlight, so Jill could hardly see her way. She had just been to the movie theater with her friends. She walked along the path. The moon was so bright that it lit the way. Jill lives at the other side of the woods. Um, children with um, working memory problems have a harder time identifying discrepancies in passages. So example, here you can see that in one sentence it claims there's no moonlight, and in another sentence it claims that the moon was very bright. Um, so um, that can be evidence that to remember you know, longer passages requires a more robust working memory system. Children with specific language impairments um, may also evidence working memory problems. Um, some children with SLI have slower verbal processing, smaller memory spans, and some difference in executive function regarding inhibition and sustaining attention. And they generally present with um, intact visual spatial storage and task switching abilities. So it's kind of a selective disruption in children with SLI. So although there's some evidence about a peak or a strong effect of working memory between 8 and 11 years, it doesn't mean that we outgrow the usefulness of the system in adulthood. Um, you know, adults may not be able to remember the actual words of a sentence, but seem to understand the meaning. Um, however, adults with brain damage may demonstrate difficulty acquiring new words, and this may be um, an effect of problems in the phonological short-term memory and the phonological loop. So, for example, um, one woman with brain damage EA, um, when asked to repeat, after eating dinner, the man walked the dog, she responded, after supper, the man took his dog for a walk. So she understood the meaning, but could not recall the actual verbatim phonological information. So in summary, for vocabulary, word learning, and working memory is most strongly associated before first grade. Um, for grammar, working memory is implicated in comprehension and production of complex syntax. And for reading, working memory supports sounding out words and supports reading comprehension. So now moving on to um, hearing loss. There's some evidence relating um, working memory and capabilities of children with cochlear implants. So deaf children who had received cochlear implants were found to have slower articulation speeds and smaller memory capacities. And this was thought to be due to slower verbal rehearsal in the phonological loop. Um, this also strongly correlated to poor word recognition skills. Children who are in oral language environments demonstrated better performance. Um, and these children also demonstrated poor performance on visual spatial working memory tasks, like the Simon tasks. So these children may not be supporting their performance with um, generated linguistic cues. This relationship was not replicated in a group of children fit with hearing aids. Um, but what was found was that overall the articulation rates of children who wore hearing aids were much faster than those of children with cochlear implants. Um, so you can see children with hearing aids as those yellow diamonds um, with a much shorter sentence duration, which means that they were articulating things much more rapidly. Um, so it might be that the um, working memory system in children with hearing aids is, is not as poor as for children with cochlear implants. In another study, cognition was measured using a working memory task where subjects were shown a continuous series of letters, such as this, and had to determine after each letter whether the previous three letters shown formed a word. 
this set their baseline cognitive ability. And then they had to do a sentence repetition task in noise. Um, this was done with two different noise conditions and two different conditions of compression in the hearing aids. Hearing aid users with high cognition always did better than users with low cognition. But this disparity was most noticeable in the condition of recognizing speech in modulated noise when the hearing aids were set with fast acting compression. So 40% of the variance in understanding was explained by cognition in this, in this particular um, experiment. So participants who had the low working memory scores showed greater benefit from slow compression and participants with high working memory showed greater benefit from fast compression. Um, so there's some clinical implications for um, the role of cognition in, in how um, perhaps hearing aids should be fit, but if we're not administering working memory tasks in the clinic, we aren't able to have that information in order to um, make decisions on amplification. So in summary, children with cochlear implants um, are more likely to have poor working memory and this may help explain their poor word recognition and their poor academic skills in general. Um, adults with hearing aids um, we found that in speech babble working memory is more important than the threshold of hearing and that fast compression times make sentence understanding and background noise difficult for adults who have poor working memory. So how can we identify working memory problems? There are different signs of working memory programs. Um, as children progress through school, the demands on working memory increase. Instructions get longer. Teachers use more complicated language. Um, so, so these signs of working memory problems can start to um, appear later through school. Um, so for example, forgetting the steps in a series of directions. Put away your math book and bring your worksheet up here and then take out your social studies book and do the reading and problems for chapters four and five. So that's a lot to retain in memory. And then if the grammar of a sentence is complex, um, children might make mistakes. So to save the princess, the knight fought the dragon. Um, it would be easier for a child to understand the sentence if it were the knight fought the dragon to save the princess. Children who exhibit these signs might also have working memory problems, such as mistakes recalling events in the right order, omissions in writing sentences from memory, um, and mistakes following numerical patterns, such as counting by threes. Um, children with working memory problems are typically in the low ability groups for literacy and numeracy. Um, in groups, they tend to be reserved and tend to not volunteer information and they are aware that they struggle to remember information so they will know that they have trouble with their memory. But these children play well with others and are able to make friends and sometimes teachers will interpret working memory deficits as attention deficits such as he's in a world of his own or she doesn't listen. There are a number of intelligence tests that have working memory subtests so um, the WISC has a working memory index. Um, the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive ability test has some subtests that uh, um, enlist working memory. Um, there's also a survey called the WMRS, the Working Memory Rating Scale, that teachers will fill out. Um, this includes items like child does not volunteer answers in group situations, um, to move to the next step in activity, the child needs frequent prompts by the teaching staff, um, etc. There are few test batteries that are specific to working memory. There's the WMTB, which um, is available in the United States, and the AWMA, which is only available in the UK. 
Um, these batteries generally include short-term memory tests, including verbal, virtual, spatial, um, and working memory tests. Um, and just to remind you the difference between a short-term memory test and a working memory test, short-term memory is just engaging storage, whereas working memory involves um, manipulating the items that are being stored in memory. So how does one support a child who has working memory problems? Um, the first thing we need to do is identify what challenges are in the, in the classroom. So this sentence here it comes from a fifth grade science task textbook. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants, some bacteria, and some protistins use the energy from sunlight to produce sugar, which cellular respiration converts into ATP, the fuel used by all living things. So, you know, there's a lot going on in that sentence that a child with working memory might just kind of interpret it as photosynthesis is the fuel used by all living things, which would be um, an incorrect interpretation of that sentence. So what kind of discourse is going on in the classroom? How is the classroom being taught? Um, is there a lot of complex sentences? Is there few um, visual supports? Things like having um, items on the chalkboard. Also, um, what are the instructional materials like? Do they include complex narratives and complicated syntax, or are they more straightforward? So. To provide support in the classroom, um, things that help auditorily are give one direction at a time, make the directions clear, short, and specific, and repeat important parts of instructions. Um, also, writing the instructions on the chalkboard is helpful. Um, having number lines available for math, having checklists. And it's not so much that the information is visual, but that the information is perpetual. The information is is there that the child can refer back to it if they've forgotten. Um, not so much for the spoken word. Can working memory be improved? So here we see a picture of a dad with a visual support for his grocery shopping. He has a shopping list. Um, but there's um, a lot of research going on as to whether working memory can be improved or whether it's kind of a fixed state in our bodies and it's biologically predetermined. Um, and there's new training programs that are out there that are being tested with some positive results for this. Um, so there may be some drugs that are helpful for improving executive function in working memory. So for example, methylphenidate is used to treat ADHD and narcolepsy. Bromocryptine is used to treat um, infertility and Parkinson's disease, um, but may also improve executive function. And then modafinil, which is an adrenergic psychostimulant, is being used in the military for um, improving alertness when um, the soldiers are under fatigue. So these are drugs that are indicated for improving executive function but they may not be helpful in cases where problems are stemming from capacity limitations. So basically, um, you know, it's only affecting a, a part of the working memory system. There are several different kind of training programs that are available for children between 7 and 15. So for example, Fast Forward, Cogmed, um, the AWMA available in the UK and then this um, soakyourhead.com is a free online tool that's supposed to help improve working memory. Um, do they work? There was an experiment done with Greek children in preschool. Half of the children received a phonological training um, including rhyming, sounding things out, while the other half of the children did art projects. And the experimental group actually ended up with better um, non-word repetition performance. Non-word repetition is um, used to index working memory sometimes. And these children also did better for reading at the end of first grade. Um, so it's thought that maybe this helped 
improve some of the automatic processes, this kind of like practice with rhyming and practice with sounding out things. Just that practice helped make some of the things more automatic for children and that released some of the cognitive resources that could be used to be devoted to other things such as you know improving reading skills etc. The um, CogMed system has been investigated um, so there has been some MRI evidence that people who use the CogMed system um, have increased activation in their parietal lobes and prefrontal cortexes. Um, children with cochlear implants who have undergone CogMed um, training have shown immediate benefits um, after the training in um, working memory tasks such as digit span and spatial span. Um, but at about six months post-training, the improvements um, by and large regressed back to the baseline. So it is to, important to be aware of disturbances in working memory. Um, you might see this in patients with stroke or brain injury. You might consider um, the possibility of working memory problems in children who have reading problems, children with cochlear implants. And then if you work with people with hearing aids, it might affect how you um, program their hearing aids. So thank you. Hopefully this is um, informative and helpful. Um, these are resources that were um, used for this talk.